Hi, Warren here from Walcolmanoy. For this particular post, uh, we're in the bowels of Walcolmanoy. We're actually in Aerobraze Engineered Technologies, AET, inside one of the spray booths. We have a couple of these stretching along this side of the, the building. So we're in the, the heart of Walcolmanoy, in a lovely picturesque little village called Pontedewa, just north of Swansea. I'm going to tell you about another product that Walcolmanoy designed and developed quite a few years ago. But to do that best, I need to go back a few years to around about 1938. The company is uh, celebrating its 80th year. Here in the UK, we're celebrating our 50th year. So we've been around for a few years. Back in 1937, two metallurgists created a new nickel-based alloy. It contained a unique constituent, chromium boride. The very high hardness values of chrome boride crystals provided this new alloy with great wear and corrosion resistant properties. Those two engineers, a Mr. Norman Cole and a Mr. Walter Edmonds, used parts of their own names to create a name for their new alloy. They took COL from Cole, MON from Edmonds, and OY from Alloy, and the name Colmanoy was created. A year later, an entrepreneur in the name of Mr. A.F. Wall bought the Colmanoy company along with the patent for this new alloy and the manufacturing process added his own name and the company Wall Colmanoy Corporation was created. Colmanoy was the very first nickel based hard facing alloy and was used extensively on downhole tools, drill bits for royal exploration and during the war years was used to extend the life of US Army tank parts such as drive gears and track sprockets. Over the years it evolved. Other elements have been added turning Colmanoy into a whole range of rods and atomized powders bringing new benefits in wear and corrosion resistant properties. Regardless of form, whether rod or powder, all of the Colmanoy products have another important feature as well as being nickel based they also contain silicon and boron. This interesting thing about nickel, silicon, boron trio is that it makes a self-fluxing material. And that's important because self-fluxing means that if you heat it up and you melt it, it bonds not only or fuses not only to itself, but it also fuses to a very wide range of other metallic materials. Uh, carbon steels, tool steels, dye steels, stainless steel, cobalt alloys, a real uh, wide range of base materials. Back in those days, the, uh, the materials they developed became known as Colmanoy 4, 5 and 6. And in the early days, these were available only in rod format. But it soon became evident that uh, it would be better to be able to apply these materials in a powder format. Equipment was designed to be able to do that. The first piece of equipment that came along was the spray welder. That was in the 1940s. In 1963, another piece of equipment was designed and developed by Wall Colmanoy called the fuse welder. And that is this. And this is what I want to show you today. We're going to demonstrate this. We're actually going to apply a nickel silicon boron type powder to uh, a particular substrate. So we'll show you how the torch actually works. But these torches are very, very useful. They're available uh, in, in four different sizes. The entire range makes up of four torches. There's a Mark VI, a Mark VII, a Mark VIII, which this one is, and a Mark IX. The Mark VI is the smallest one, and that's really designed for doing tiny, small edges, intricate designs, intricate parts. The Mark IX is a much bigger torch and designed to de deposit a lot of powder and do much bigger components. Each of those torches is available with a, a number of smaller nozzles, so you really can tailor the equipment and the torch necessary to do the particular job, uh, which makes it very, very flexible and very, uh, very easy to use. First thing you'll notice about it, it's actually connected to a couple of gas pipes poking out of the back, so it's uh, oxyacetylene. I've got the cylinders behind me, they're already set up, so I don't have to muck about with pressures, and you'll notice there's a lever. The lever simply opens a valve which allows the powder which is stored in the hopper on the top into a mixing chamber where it's actually carried down through to the, uh, to the torch flame and, the, and deposited to the, to the workpiece. It's quite easy to use, it hasn't changed a lot over the years, very very useful indeed. So if you're in a tool room environment, if you're in a repair and maintenance environment, it's an ideal tool, an ideal piece of equipment for making repairs. Uh, putting material back uh, due to industrial wear, abrasion, impact, corrosion, that sort of thing. 
We even manufacture a range of products that actually contain tungsten carbide. So it's very possible to, 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 to add an extremely abrasive wear resistant coating to a number of parts. Just for today's demonstration, I'm simply going to use a small piece of mild steel. You'll notice the one side's been prepared. Um, with, as with all sort of welding, um, brazing type processes, cleanliness is next to godliness, it really is. So I've specially cleaned the surface of this with uh, shot blast equipment with it using a 24 grit steel uh, shot. Avoid at all costs ceramics and that sort of thing. So sandblasting, we don't use sandblasting. It can really cause problems at a later date. So uh, steel shot, chilled cast iron, that sort of thing is absolutely ideal. So this is prepared and, uh, and pretty much ready to go. So just before I light the torch, I will mention a couple of things. One, for safety purposes, it's always advisable to wear gas welding goggles. You don't need electric welding goggles, it's far too dark. Uh, but ordinary gas welding goggles, these are GW5s. And I'm just wearing a pair of gloves. These are ordinary uh, lightweight gloves. I'm going to set the torch up in a second and establish a neutral flame. And this is really important because uh, there are three real conditions uh, as far as a flame setting is concerned. Firstly, we can achieve a carburizing flame in which case we burn excess amounts of carbon and that releases free carbon into the flame. Not necessarily a bad thing um, because for some hard facing materials it, it, it may have a slight effect. Uh, other than that it's not really that bad at all. Uh, one condition that we're going to aim for and I would always try to advise is uh, a strictly neutral flame and that of course is when we burn equal amounts of acetylene with equal amounts of, uh, of oxygen and that keeps it then very very neutral. One type of flame we want to avoid at all costs is an oxidizing flame. Obviously that is when we burn more oxygen than, uh, than acetylene. That then puts free oxygen into the flame and then we can oxidize the powder as we're uh, depositing it onto the base material. We can also oxidize the base material. And that, that then can have damaging effects on the deposit that we produce at a later date. So we want to avoid oxidizing flames at all costs. I'll just show you how those work. Turn on the acetylene first. That now is a normal, perfectly uh, neutral flame. If I turn down the oxygen a little bit, and we see the blue flame appear there, that's a carburizing flame. And if we just increase the, uh, decrease the oxygen a little bit, until the flame, the feather disappears, we get a nice round cone, that's a perfectly neutral flame. Increase the oxygen, and you can see the flame gets shorter and it becomes a little bit more harsh to listen to. That's an oxidizing flame. We want to avoid that at all costs. So we just turn down the oxygen a little bit more and pull it back to neutral. That's it. That's how to set that. So I've got powder in the hopper. Uh, we're using Colmenoid 234, a powder that we, use, we sell quite a lot to to the glass container industry for repairing and protecting uh, cast iron glass moulds. I'm going to spray this uh, spray this pot and just show you how it works. Okay, I'm going to apply a preheat first of all to the base material. An ideal preheat for the fuse welder is 300 degrees. How do we tell when it's at 300 degrees? Well, in an ordinary piece of steel like this, that's pretty easy to see because the part will change colour. At the moment, the part's just gone blue, and in a few seconds, that blue will burn off, and it'll turn into a straw colour. And after a few further seconds, that straw will burn off, and it'll go back to clear. And that's it. That's pretty much 300 degrees. Now, what I've done here is apply a pre-spray, a dust coat, if you like. The idea of that is that if you're working on a larger area, and you need to protect it from the atmosphere because you don't want oxidation taking place on the other part while you're working, just give it a dust coat. And that dust coat will protect the other part from oxidation, from the atmosphere, while you're working somewhere else. Now there's two things I can do from this point on. One, I can wet that powder out. By wetting out, it means I can actually melt the powder to the base material. Remember, I'll never melt the base material and that will create a perfectly metallurgically bonded coating. Or I can do a build-up direct on top of that. But for the sake of this demo, I'll wet that out first so as you can see what it looks like. 
Now as I apply more heat and take the temperature up, you'll see that the powder starts to take on a wet appearance. Starting at one of the corners, I'll work my way across the base material backwards and forwards, nice and slowly until the whole surface is covered with this nice shiny appearance. That's it. Now that's completely fused to the base material. I can now do a build up on top of that. That coating thickness is probably about 30 pounds. Uh, less than a third of a millimetre in thickness, so it's, uh, it's a very, very thin coating. Perfectly usable, but most people want something a little bit thicker than that, so we're now going to do a build up on the top. So I'm just applying powder by depressing the lever and introducing powder and fusing it along as we go. And I'll work my way side to side until we cover the whole test piece. And there we go. I've put on probably about three millimeters, all in one go, of a hard facing material, no dilution with the base material, so it does exactly what it says on the tin. We've got good, good sort of impact resistance, we've got some corrosion resistance, uh, and there's a whole multitude of other powders that work with this, including the ones with tungsten carbide, that work in exactly the same way. It is as easy as that. This is the finished test part. What we're going to do now, and we'll do this for the next post, you've now seen how the powder goes on, you've seen what it looks like from the outside, just while that's cooling down, when it does cool down, I'm going to take it into the lab, and then the next post will actually show you what it looks like on the inside. We'll cut the part up, we'll run it through various bits of equipment that we've got in the lab, including an optical digital microscope, and we'll run a hardness test on it, just to make sure it does exactly what it says on the label. Um, and then we'll, we'll show you the results. We'll show you the metallurgical structure uh, of, of the deposit. We'll show you the interface and we'll show you it's uh, clean, free from inclusions, clear, clean from, uh, uh, clear from porosity. And then you'll have a much better picture of what that looks like. Okay, thanks for watching.